Good morning. Can you please look at the person beside you and say, I want to greet you, good morning, with the joy of Jesus. Go ahead. Good morning. And I greet all of you, even those watching online. Can you all wave to them? We greet you today with the joy of Jesus. So, what are we going to talk about today? Today, as we carry on with our series on work, I have the privilege of delivering a message to all of you. Today, I am a messenger, and what I want to open up with is a little bit of where we're at as far as this pandemic is concerned. What I want to show you are some of my favorite memes about the pandemic so far. Let's take a look. Let's see which one of these are your favorite as well, all right? The first is this. When I used to dream about working from home, me, now working from home, man, is that you? Or could it be this, for those of you that like the Marvel series, working from home day one, day five, ganyan na yan, yan. So we're looking at working from home and what's happening, some memes. Ito, some of you may have had this. You accidentally shared the wrong screen. Or maybe some of you on Zoom, here's the reality, Zoom meeting, audio, ganyan ang itsura. Pagka with video, ang ganda, di ba? So is that you? How about this? I love this. Let's bring it to the local context. Binalatan ko ang mga dilata para surprise ang ulam namin mamaya. Okay pa, I love the Philippines. I don't know about you guys. And then finally, work from home, expectation, reality. I'm not sure where you are at as far as work is concerned, but the world has changed. Agree? And as the world has changed, here's one encouraging meme. I like this picture. You look at God, he's looking at all that's happening and he's I'll be thinking, I like working from home, being able to see all of these things. I want to give you some good news, bad news. Now that we've gotten some of that out of the way, good news and bad news about work and what is happening in our world today. Let's look at some bad news first. Bad news. I've discovered from this survey that one out of two Filipino workers feels overworked. What does that mean? I want to look ask you to look at the person beside you. That means every other person here, half of the people here feel overworked. Second piece of information. Did you know that one out of four Filipinos are thinking of quitting their jobs due to stress, anxiety, and depression? That means if you look at the person beside you, one of you, alternatingly, or half of everybody here feels overworked, tired, and one out of four is thinking, ayoko na. I think I will be part of the great resignation, the great attrition, all of these things that are happening in the world and even in our homes and in our country. Some added news regarding this is that there is a rise of presenteeism. What is presenteeism? This is where you are present, but you're not present. Maybe some of you are going through that even as we speak right now. Whether you're here live or you're watching online, you're here, but you're not here. You're present, but you're not really present. Marami ka yung iniisip. There's so many things racing your minds and hearts. And like I said, wait for it. I'm a messenger of some good news of joy from Jesus for you all. So some added news, when you look broader, when they look at employees, people working, apparently a lot of people want to feel joy, 90%. But those that feel joy are very little. There's a big gap. So what do we do? Friends, what do we do given that this is the bad news? What is the good news we have? Let me give it to you. The good news is, I love this verse. Weeping may last through the night, but joy comes with the morning. Can you read this this verse with me again? Weeping may last through the night, but joy comes with the morning. I love this picture so much. That as I was praying, Lord, what message would you like to give your people today, all over, who are watching this live or on demand? And God impressed on my heart a few things from the Word of God. And as I unpacked this for you, and as I was preparing, I put this verse to encourage everybody. And then I reached out to a dear pastor who lost his wife in recent weeks and months. I haven't been able to reach out to him. And as I reached out to this dear pastor from CCF, I want to read from you an excerpt of what he messaged me, if my phone will allow me to. There you go. He said this. I asked him, how are you doing? Our family's praying for you. And he he messaged me this. He said, we are coping well so far. Two of my grandchildren keep me company. 
and my daughters visit me every day. I try to keep a sober front before my children to encourage them to move on until they get used to the absence of their mother. The loss of a loved one, especially a spouse, is something one never gets over. There are still brief moments when I wake up around 3 or 4 a.m. and I wonder if the events of the past month were real or not. Maybe some of us, that's what we're also asking. Has this really happened? All of these things that have happened during this pandemic? I still hang her picture on my wall and briefly at times, I pretend that she's still here after all. I've not shed much tears, but that's just me. I have my outlets for my emotions, part of which is keeping a positive, hopeful, and biblical mindset. And you know what he gave me as he messaged me? He gave me this exact verse. He said, weeping may last for a night, but joy comes in the morning. I lift my eyes, he said, the dawn is breaking. Friends, I'm here to deliver a message of hope. Whatever it is you might be going through, Jesus wants to tell you, although weeping may have been lasting, maybe not just for a night, but for a while, the joy is here, the dawn is breaking. Can you look at the person beside you and say, the dawn is breaking, the joy is here, it's coming. I wanna bow our heads, ask us to bow our heads down and pray for all of us that may have lost loved ones, like this dear pastor and a number of our pastors. And I was asking myself, what does it feel like to come back and celebrate and be here face to face in this hall, but not, not have that loved one with you? It's hard. So let's pray. And many of you are going through some difficult circumstances in your families and even in the workplace. So let's bring this to God right now and then let's unpack the Word of God to see how exactly we can have joy, how we can see this even affect our workplace. Is that all right? Let's bow our heads. Father, we thank you once again for taking us through this. And we remember, Lord God, that as we follow you, if you take us to this, to whatever that is, you will take us through it. Thank you for the words that you will now share to all of us as we look to you Look to your words. We pray that it will not just be something we hear, but it will be something that sinks deep and transforms us as we leave this place. We thank you for the privilege of worshiping like this. Thank you for the, the joy of being able to gather once again face to face. And even as the world has wars and economic troubles and challenges and even the upcoming elections has a big question mark in many people's minds, Lord, we thank you that you are still in control. You are our God. You have brought us here today. So help us maximize this time to learn from you and be transformed by you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Amen and amen. All right, guys. What will we look at? You know what I realized is as we look at that big backdrop of the problems of work, even working from home and the challenges that many of us are feeling and experiencing, as I mentioned, the joy will come in the morning. And even greater news is joy is the antidote. Look at Jesus' example in Hebrews 12, verse 2, verse over here on the slide. It says, Jesus, as we fix our eyes on him, the author and perfecter of our faith, for the joy. Can everybody say joy? For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, despised the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And we remembered what that was like, to have to die and rise again to the service last Sunday, Resurrection Sunday. But today, I want to encourage you with that thought, that Jesus himself was able to endure, overcome through joy. The joy set before him. This is the antidote for us. And today, our simple thought, the simple message, can you please look at the person beside you if you're online, look at the person watching with you. If you're watching by yourself, just do this to yourself and say, work with joy. Go ahead, guys. Work with joy. Now, some of you are saying, you know, Edric, that sounds nice, but can I really have joy in what I'm going through? Maybe you heard a little bit of that sharing that I gave of that dear pastor, but I want to also give you this verse. I love how Habakkuk reminds us, though the fig tree should not blossom, may problema ba sa trabaho niyo? Do you have a problem with your work, with your business, with that circumstance? Maybe you're in school, you're having challenges at the school, at, at, the, uh, at that level of education. There be no fruit on the vines, so the yield of the olive tree should fail. My business, God, my work, God, you know, you, you know I'm going through. It's really challenging right now. Though the flock should be cut off from the fold and there be no cattle in the stall, I have no more source. It's drying out. God, what am I going to do? Here's what the Bible is encouraging you with as well. The Bible tells us in verse 18, yet I will exult in the Lord. I will what? What's the word, everyone? Rejoice. It is possible 
to have joy despite challenging circumstances. In fact, I want to remind us that our circumstances don't even have to dictate our joy. We can choose to have joy despite whatever is going through us, even if it's a financial, work-related crisis that you might be going through. We can have joy. This is the antidote, the solution to help us overcome, to persevere. So let's ask the question, well, Edric, how? How can we have joy as we go about our life and our work and the things we're doing? First, I want to encourage you, if you have not completed the Work Matters series, you can go back, watch them. For those that are watching online, if you haven't caught the past messages, the first one was on Work Matters. And, you know, the series set up why it's so holy and important. And then we had uh, Pastor Peter back-to-back speaking about how we can go and be extra. Then after that, we had Pastor Ricky asking us the question, who's your boss? Who do you really work for? Go through these messages again and see how that can encourage you to help reframe your work and say, hey, you know what, I can. I can find joy even as I go through this. And then Paul spoke to us about being a missionary in the workplace. So I encourage you, step one, if you want to know how to have joy or to restore that as an antidote to whatever you might be going through even in the workplace, recap, go through these series and let God speak to you there. If you're watching online for the first time, this is a good place to go as well. Now, the other way we can help work with joy and see that change our lives is through this verse in Ecclesiastes. Can anybody tell me who wrote the book of Ecclesiastes? I can hear you barely through the masks. Anybody? How about our DFAM? Anybody? Solomon. All right. Solomon wrote this, and I asked myself, who's got a great track record as far as work? And as I was spending my own quiet time with God, reading and studying, I came across Ecclesiastes, and I realized Solomon had quite a bit of accomplishments as far as work is concerned. He became very wealthy, had a lot of wisdom, built a lot of stuff. So we want to unpack Ecclesiastes and see what can we learn about having joy through the work? How can we see this solution transform us? Let's take a look at five parts of this and see the highlights and see how God can speak to us. So shall we go through this together? Can you read it with me? Even so, I have noticed, go ahead, one thing at least that is good. It is good for people to eat, drink, and enjoy their work under the sun during the short life has given them and to accept their lot in life. And it is a good thing to receive wealth from God and the good health to enjoy it, to enjoy your work and accept your lot in life. This is indeed a gift from God. And the verse closes with, "Good God keeps such people so busy enjoying life that they take no time to brood over the past. These are the highlights of the verse that we will unpack today, and we will see exactly how we can work with joy. Are you guys ready? Let's unpack this now. Let me give you a quick backgrounder to this verse. The book of Ecclesiastes is kind of sad from all the other stuff that Solomon wrote, the Proverbs, we see his life. It's sad because there's a lot of things that say, you know what, everything's meaningless. You see there, vanity, vanity of doing, vanity of having, vanity of being. So a lot of vanity, meaningless. So Solomon's saying, you know what, I've done a lot of stuff with my work. I've accomplished quite a bit of things. And I'm telling you something, all of this is meaningless, vanity. So he's unpacking all of that. But as he does that, this is where we insert ourselves and we will look at Ecclesiastes 5. And as we look at it here, it's interesting that given that backdrop, everything's meaningless, everything's vain. In Filipino, dinaanan ko na yan. Na-experience ko na lahat yan. Ko ano man ang pleasure. Whatever those pleasures and things that you might aspire to have, maybe even through the work, I've been there, I've been that. <laughs> I've been there, I've done that. I've seen all of these things. And he's saying, you know what? It's not really all that. And then... As he writes this, what I found very interesting as we open up this verse, given all of that, everything's meaningless, all is vain, Solomon says something very, very interesting. He says, even so, having said all of that, meaningless, vanity, etc., I've noticed one thing that is good. He says, it is good for people to eat, drink, and enjoy their work. So I found it very interesting as I was studying this, I realized what is God trying to remind us of? 
given that backdrop, everything is meaningless, everything is in vain, dinaan ako na lahat yan, Solomon is actually taking a step back. And he's helping all of us, the readers, to say, guys, step back. Amidst all of that, I found something good. Can everybody say good? He said good. And as he highlighted this, it's important for us to now pay attention. What is that good thing? And he says this is what is good to enjoy our work. So I asked the question, what does that mean? What does it mean that it is good to enjoy our work? Well, when we look at the Hebrew, I want to share with you guys very interestingly, the word enjoy here, so enjoy their works, enjoy this part over here is two Hebrew words. The first is the word ra'ah. Ra'ah. What does ra'ah mean? Ra'ah means it's like I'm able to fully experience this thing. Ra'ah. So what is that thing? The second part of the Hebrew is the word tov. Tov is something good, something pleasant. So the Bible is telling us, amidst all of that drama, all the stuff that Solomon is saying, you know, I've been there, done that's meaningless, it's done. Hey, but there's something good. And that good thing is this, for us to have a full experience of what is pleasant, what is good. That's what these words mean. So how does that translate? Uh, when the Bible says it is good, we have a full experience of that, it is pleasant, it is agreeable to the senses, and even excellent, what does that mean for us? How does that translate? The way I want to translate it is this. If we want to work with joy, if we want to help that or allow that to help us persevere, overcome burnout, stress, challenges that we might have at the work front, whatever the work might be. You might be a, someone working at the corporate sense or an employee. You might be someone who has a business. You might be someone who's working as a student. You're a student, that's your work. Or you could be a homemaker. What does that look like for you and for me? This is how I helped paraphrase or helped appreciate those verses. When the Bible says it is good for us to enjoy our work, it is for us to be able to taste and see that God is good. The Bible tells us how blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. So let me ask a question for you. Wherever you find yourself working, once again, it could be as an employee, a business owner, you could be a student, that's your work, making sure you do your studies well, or you could be a, a homemaker like my wonderful wife. Whatever that white wife might be, whatever that work play situation might be, my question to all of us is this. Have we been able to experience what is pleasing, what is good, a full measure of that, and taste and see that God is good? Some of us might say yes. Some of, my, some of us might be honest and saying, actually, no. Edric, right now, you don't know what I'm going through. The good news is I don't know, but God does. And as you're hearing this message from him, here's what he's trying to remind us of. There's two ways we can experience this goodness, what is pleasing in our workplace. One is we can wait for it. Say, okay, Lord, my boss is really demanding. The circumstances around me is toxic. It's so stressful. This business dealing that I'm dealing with, ah, it's just, I, I, I don't know what to do. My studies, it's so hard for me to adapt to working from home and my grades and you might, my pressure, oh, it's so hard for me, God. Well, guess what? We can wait for it or we can create it. We can make it happen. That's what I wanted to use as our first point. Instead of us waiting for things to become joyful around us, could it be that what God is trying to tell you and me right now is if we want to experience joy as we work, we need to help create that joyful experience. We need to be a joy giver. Let me give you examples. So I know of a, a businessman and their partners, and one of their businesses to this pandemic was really hit hard. They had thousands of employees with various facilities. And as the pandemic hit hard, it was not joyful. They were stressed about the cash management. They were stressed about taking care, taking care of all those employees and what to do. And maybe some of you are saying, yes, I can relate to that. As they were thinking about what should we do, should we just 
sell and give up this business because it's really a drain and it's really challenging? What should we do? And as they thought about it and prayed about it, they realized, you know what? We want to preserve God's testimony. We want to ask ourselves, instead of waiting for something to happen and feeling great about this and experiencing joy in this workplace, why don't we find a way to give joy, to be a blessing even to the people that are working for us? So you know what they did that really impacted me personally? They decided to stick it out, to stay in that firm, and to use even the pandemic and its challenges for good to be a blessing. They decided to set up speakers at those facilities that would play worship music, that would give them biblical messages and inspiration and hope so that even as they were stuck there, many of them, because of the quarantine protocols, they got to hear God's word. They got to be encouraged by God's word. And they used that for good. And as a result of that, the joy, even if the challenges are still present and happened, was restored. That's an example. How can you look at your work environment right now if you're a business owner or you're an employee and say, even if there are challenges around me and the joy seems to be gone, can I choose instead to be a joy giver? What can I do so that there is a joyful environment and we can bring back the joy of Jesus? Are you guys with me so far? What if you're a student? You know, one of my sons who will remain anonymous right now was going through a funk. You funk like... He went to this point where he was like, you know what, I don't really know what I'm good at. I feel so sad. I feel so unproductive. You know, I don't know if I've really learned anything, if I've really developed any skills. And it was hard, you know, because my wife and I, you know, we don't have all the answers. But when he shared this to us, we prayed. We said, how do we encourage this son of ours, this anonymous son of ours, as he was going through this funk? And my wife, God bless her, we talked about it. We encouraged him and said, well, why don't you ask yourself, instead of what is happening to you, ask yourself, what can you do about what's happening around you to your fellow students, the people that you are interacting with? And so what he decided to do is he joined an organization in that school system. And as he joined that organization, they created initiatives to help other students on leadership, on learning the Bible, on coping with the learning systems. And as they did that, through the years of focusing on that instead of himself and circumstances and why he's not really doing much or he doesn't feel good about himself, he started to have joy. And that organization started to also grow with the help of many of the other leaders there. So I'm encouraging even students, you might be going through a situation where you're saying, you know what, the joy is also gone from me. How do I restore that joy back in my situation? Point number one, you can be a joy giver. Look to create opportunities for other people to experience joy. One last example here. So you could be in the workplace as a corporate guy, a business owner. You could be a student or you could be a homemaker. Like I mentioned, my wife. She gave me permission to share this. So my wife, God bless her, has been homeschooling our kids for 100 years. Well, forever, right? She's been homeschooling our kids forever. And I'm so blessed. And I have to say this. Many of you might not be able to say this with as much authenticity as me, but I literally live with joy. I live with joy, but here's the thing. I don't know if I can work with joy. <laughs> I love you, but no, I'm just kidding. So here's what I wanted to share that she told me I could share. She's homeschooling our kids, and this is part of her work, right? She homeschools our kids. She takes care of me, our house. And she was telling me that at one point, so we've been homeschooling forever. Many of you that know our story, she's been homeschooling forever. One of our daughters who will remain anonymous one day said mom i hate homeschooling so at first when she heard that and i heard that we were in shock we're like no way this is like what we've been building and advocating our whole lives this is like how are we going to respond to this our daughter hates homeschooling that's like not allowed in the mendoza household right so we step back and my wife stepped back she's like huh why so she asked the question, and as she was processing this big statement, my wife was very honest. After that, she was smiling to that, but she talked to me, said, honey, so my wife, Joy, is a very joyful person, but in the rare moments that there is no joy, I get concerned. So she was like this. She goes, oh, honey, what am I going to do? Our daughter does not like to homeschool. I feel like a failure as a mother. I feel like all these years I put in all these things, I've been saying all the talks you've been giving is like a fail, fail, fail. 
So I was looking at her and I said, Lord Jesus, how can I encourage my wife? At first I was like, you know what? Yeah, we're a failure. Let's just quit this baby. No, I'm, I'm kidding. I didn't say that. I was like, okay, how can I encourage my wife? And you know, as we processed it and we prayed, here's the blessing that I had as my wife processed it. You know what she said? She said, I realized the problem was not our daughter, the anonymous daughter that said that. My wife said, it's not even a problem of whether she can handle the homeschooling because my wife actually did this. For those that are homeschooling, this is a homeschooling insider joke. She said, you know what? If you don't like homeschooling, I'll send you back to school. It's a homeschooling joke, right? School is amazing. I went to school. But she said that, and she said that didn't work, you know. And as they talked about it, she said, I realized the problem was me. My wife said, I'm the problem. It's not my daughter. It's not my daughter's capacity. It's me. So how can I be a blessing to her? How can I help her revive the joy in this experience? And you know what my wife did? She said, it's not the academics. It's not the homeschooling rigor. It's my relationship. I'm forgetting that at the core of our relationship, which will allow for a good learning experience, is a mom-daughter discipleship. So she started to do that, and she said she wasn't a very good model of joy also because she would kind of lose her cool at times with this daughter. It's like, ah, why don't you get this? And she's getting frustrated. So that's kind of what she realized. It is actually her. So, So when she decided to change that, and I'm looking at my notes here, she started to hug her more. It's my wife. Never mind, oversharing. My wife hugged her more. I wanted to say she should hug me more also, but she hugged her more. And as she hugged her more, she started using more affirming words instead of showing that she was frustrated. She said, I'm so blessed, dear daughter Anonymous, that you are trying your best. And she focused on the effort. That's a great parenting reminder for all of us. You want to be a blessing to your kids? Focus on the effort, not so much on the actual thing, because they might become a fixed mindset and not a growth mindset, that's a separate conversation. So my wife was encouraging her, and as she did this, she started having separate times to just build a relationship. She did girl time, she would go shopping with this daughter, and as she did these things, you know what happened? That daughter's heart changed. When I interviewed this anonymous daughter very recently, I wanted to make sure I could share this story. I said, hey, anonymous daughter, how's the homeschooling now? You know what she said? It's so fun. And I praise God that she shared that because what are we learning? If we want to restore joy, don't focus so much on what will happen to you, but instead ask, how can I give joy? How can I strengthen my relationship with my daughter in the case of my wife? How can I be a blessing to her and help do that so that she will restore her joy, I will restore my joy? We need to be a joy giver. So that is this first point. Let's move on. I encourage us to think about this. Instead of looking for greener grass, it's my brother-in-law who encouraged me with this line. I love this line. Instead of looking for greener grass, make your grass greener. If you want to experience joy and restore that, even in the work you do, instead of saying, Aalis na ako dito. I will leave this environment that's so toxic. Have you asked yourself the question, maybe you are the toxic person and you need to help effect some change and make it greener first that you might be a joy giver. My dad, God bless his wisdom, he told me, son, in the major decisions of your life in work, you need to make sure you remember this principle. If you are not happy where you are, how will you know you will be happy where you go? That's a great reminder for all of us. So if you're experiencing challenging circumstances, principle number one, be a joy giver. Try and effect whatever change you can there first and add that joy. You might want to actually do something like this as a worst case scenario. Check this out. So, baka mahirap yung mga examples ko, baka ito na lang. This might be something simple for you guys to do, to literally have joy in the work you do. Enjoy this. I showing this video, you know, you can literally just choose to do that. And you know, Pinoy is only in the Philippines, right? Only in the Philippines. I love this country. I don't know about you guys. I love our country. 
People can do this and well, yeah, this is where you all clap, I love it. We love the dancing policemen of our country, right? Joy in what they're doing. So let's move on. What's our second point? As we look at Ecclesiastes, let's move on. So we've seen that the first thing the Bible is telling us to work with joy is to have these experiences of what is pleasant and good and not just to wait for it. Let's create it. Let's be joy givers. The second is this. It says, uh, they've seen under the sun during the short life God has given them and to accept their lot in life. What does that mean? It is good for us to enjoy our work, but the Bible is also saying to accept their lot in life. Now, these are big words, big words. I want to unpack this by reminding us of a few things. First, when we say accept our lot in life, could it be that the reason you don't have joy in your work right now is because, or it's been robbed, is because we are deeply not happy and unsatisfied and discontent. The Bible tells us that godliness is a means of great gain when accompanied by contentment. Could this be the message that God has for you so that you might restore that joy? You're not content. You're ungrateful. We're ungrateful. That is possibly why we're losing our joy. So my question is, as the Bible says, are you content with your lot in life right now? The Bible tells us to give thanks in everything. So I do not know your circumstances. But could it be that even as you look at it, you're just not grateful? You know, my one daughter, who will also remain anonymous, she is one of our most spunky, joyful daughters. When we were first doing this culture of praying at the dinner table, I remember her one day, she said, okay, it's my turn. She was very young. She said, dear Jesus, thank you for the wind. Thank you for the light. Thank you for the chair. Thank you for the table. Thank you for my mommy. Thank you for my daddy. And as she kept going, thanking God for literally everything, my sons who were older said, in Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> so why do I share that with all of you? That's kind of the heart of it. Regardless of what's going on around us, there's actually a lot that we can be thankful for. Are we content with our circumstances? Now, I need to be very clear here. Contentment is not complacency. Ito, hanggang dito na lang ako. So... I'll just accept my lot in life. That's not what the Bible is saying. Contentment is the spirit of gratefulness, but it does not lead us to idleness, to laziness, to that defeatist mindset of, eto, hanggang dito na lang ako. That's it. That's my lot in life. Instead, I like how the Bible reminds us in 2 Timothy 1 verse 7, it says, God has not given us a spirit of timidity. Can everyone say timid? But instead of power and love and discipline. That's the spirit that God has given us. So if we are to be grateful or content, it is not to be complacent. It is to do, and I love this picture here. I love this line of Martin Luther King Jr. As he was encouraging some young people. He says, what I'm saying to you this morning, my friends, even if it falls in your lot to be a street sweeper, go on out and sweep streets like Michelangelo painted pictures. Sweep streets like... Handel and Beethoven composed music. Sweet street, sweep streets like Shakespeare wrote poetry. Sweep streets so well that all the hosts of heaven and earth will have to pause and say, here lived a great street sweeper who swept his job well. That's what it means. Hindi yung eto, hanggang dito na ako, that's it. I am going to do the best I can right now. If I'm going to be a policeman, I'm going to dance. I'm going to enjoy this. If I'm going to be a street sweeper, I'm going to do it like this is the best job in the world. Are you with me? That's this spirit. Lord, thank you that I have a job. I'm going to do it to the best of my ability. Despite the circumstances, this is how I can restore joy into what I am doing, into the work that I'm doing. Now, as we look at gratefulness, I wanted to highlight something that really impacted me very recently. As I was reading and studying, I came across this book by John Mark Comer called The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry, and it is an altogether message of its own. But the highlight here is even as we are not being complacent, we're being grateful and content in our circumstances, but moving and letting God lead us, it's so important that we do this. We need to ask ourselves, what are my limitations. He says, we live in a culture that wants to tr transgress this, not accept them, to cheat time, space, watch every new film, read every book, travel to every country, rise to the top of every field, win every award, make a list of who's who. And as we're doing that, 
I want you to fill in the blank for yourself. What is it that you aspire to do that possibly is creating so much stress in your life? Do you want to be the next Elon Musk? And you're going after money. And you're thinking, it's okay. You know what? I can do all things, right? But it's creating all this unhealthy stress. And the Bible says, in the pursuit of all that, it can lead to all sorts of dis- disturbances, stress, challenges, problems. Are you trying to imagine yourself doing things that God is saying, this isn't actually what I have for you? Could it be that is the reason? For example, I love how he closes. He says, what if these limitations aren't something to fight but to gratefully accept as a signpost to God's call on our souls? Could it be that God's saying, the reason why you have limits is not because I want to limit you, but I want you to enjoy the boundaries of those limits and to thrive there. For example, you know, in the parenting space, when you tell your children, and you've seen many of these in movies and other places, you can be anything you want or you can do anything your heart says you can be or anything you put your mind to be, that is, I hate to say this, nonsense. Nonsense. If I told that to my son and he went to the top of this building and said, I can be Superman, Dad, and he jumps off, what's going to happen? He can't be Superman. He can't stop a bullet. He can't stop a speeding train. There's no way that that can. Are you following me? So it's not a healthy thing to say. We do not tell our children, you know, you can do anything you want to be or be anything you want to be. You can do anything your heart sets yourself to do or your mind thinks. Instead, what I encourage us to say is this. When we look at these limitations or the things God has given us, we want to say, you can be whatever God wants you to be. You can be whatever God has placed in your life that you can be. Are you guys following me? And that is so, so, so important. Because when we frame it that way, then we will realize that because God has given those abilities, even those boundaries, He will allow you and I, our children, to thrive in that context. Are you with me? So that's the same reminder for all of us. We need to be honest and accept, Lord, I I, I can't be Superman. I'll be honest with you. I wanted to be like an Elon Musk uber billionaire, easy tech, but I realized that's not my calling. That's not what God wants for me. What God wants for me is to preach the word to you guys right now. Are you with me? That's what he wants me to do. He wants me to study and deliver the word. That's what God has called me to do. How do we know what God has called us to be so that we might work within those parameters, the gifts, the skills, the talents, all that God has allowed for us? Well, I have great news for you. Stand by for next week. Can you look at the person beside you and say, stand by for next week, go. That's the message next week. If you're watching online, please catch that. Pastor Peter will close out the series and talk about how will you know? How will I know that this is it for me, God, that I am working within these uh, giftings, parameters, etc. that you have. In the meantime, I want to encourage you, gratefully accepting means to focus on what you can do within these limits, not what you cannot. So there is a student that I knew that was very skinny and he wanted to do athletic things that were beyond his strength capacity. He didn't have the strength to do other athletic uh, particular sports. He couldn't do the sprints with all the other peers. So he was tempted to lose his joy as a student until his dad or his guardian reminded him, hey, you know what? You are skinny for a reason. God gave that design of your body so that he could use it. So why don't you try something else? He tried distance running and became an outstanding athlete in that school in the area of distance running. That's a simple example of how we can reframe and say, okay, God, these limits are not to limit me, but to help me really thrive because that's why I'm built, designed to be this way. Are you with me? All right. I love how Paul modeled this for all of us. For I am the least of the apostles, he says, not fit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church, but by the grace of God. This is one of my life verses. Really, by the grace of God, I am what I am. Can you all say that with me? By the grace of God. One more time. Beautiful. Online, I can't hear you. I'm just kidding. By the grace of God. It is really by God's grace that we are who we are, and we need to embrace that. Lord, yes, even if I might not be able to do these things, that's okay, because this is how you've built me. And I want to thrive in that. What is our point here again? As we wind down this point, restore joy through gratitude. Now, I want to share with you a quick clip of someone whom we saw as very joyful in our home. And then I'm going to pick up the pace and wind us down. This is uh, someone in our home. I want you to hear her quick story. I asked, how is this 
family member of ours, always joyful, even if there have been tragedies in her life, losing her parents, financial challenges, losing a job opportunity of being overseas and having to come back home forcefully, having an awful breakup with the relationship that she was in, we asked her, Bakit masaya ka pa? I want you to hear this really quickly. Well, sa lahat ng daan mo sa buhay, John, how are you able to remain joyful? Even as you work, dito sa amin, kasama namin. Ano po, sir? Um, me, ano po, parang lagi na lang po yung, hindi sinasaisip ko po, sir, na laging sigad sa puso ko. Tapos yung, yung nangyari nga po sa akin yung about dun sa ex-boyfriend ko, yung forgive and forget na, yung God nga na forgive, na forgive po tayong lahat sa kasalanan lang. Bakit po tayo hindi po natin kaya i-forgive? Yung sa trabaho naman po, uh, nagiging masaya po ako sa trabaho kasi po kahit ano pong hirap nung, nung trabaho ko, kung baga sabi nga po nila, pag mahal mo po yung trabaho mo, yung ginagawa mo, tapos uh, parang kahit na gano'ng kahirap po yung trabaho, mag enjoy ka pa rin po dun sa trabaho, basta mahal mo po yung ginagawa mo, tsaka nasa puso mo po yung ginagawa mo. Tapos yung, nung, every time po na nagbabasa ko, tinuruan niyo po kami na, na magbasa po ng Bible, na yung Nung every night po nagbabasa po kami ng Bible, may nabasa po ako sa Bible na yung sa Colossus 3, 23 po. Yung 3 verse 23 po na, ano man ang gawin nyo na gawin, na, ano man ang gawin ninyo, gawin ninyo ito ng buong katapatan na parang ang Panginoon na pinaglilingkuran nyo at hindi po yung tao. So parang yung po yung, kahit anong hirap po nung pinagdadaanan ko sa trabaho, tapos yung mga naging Pasko po, parang yun lang po yung iniisip ko para maging masaya pa rin po ako sa trabaho. Sabi mo kanina na, parang pagka mahal mo talaga yung trabaho, kahit nung hirap, kahit mo iranas, no? mahal mo ba yung trabaho? It's honest po sir, na minsan, syempre po sa hirap nung panahon, especially po nung nagpasok po yung pandemic, minsan po naiisip po po minsan na umalis po ulit, pumunta ng abroad. Pero nung, nung pandemic po na, na na dumipas po yung pandemic, na parang blessed pa rin po ako kasi kahit po paano, yung iba na wala nung trabaho, tapos ako stay pa rin po na may trabaho. Kaya parang tuloy pa rin po yung pagtulong ko sa pamilya ko. Kaya mahal ko po yung trabaho ko tsaka masaya po ako sa trabaho kasi ito po yung binigay sa akin ng Diyos. So kailangan po kong magpala. Thank you, John. Uh, what a blessing. You know, I was reminded that as you said, right, even if she wasn't able to earn more by working overseas, getting better work environment, she learned to be grateful that she has a job at all. And she could have lost it if she was overseas. She's able to work with joy. So I need to make a disclaimer. Please do not pirate her from our family. We love her. John, we love you. I love this verse, uh, this quote here that reminds us of gratitude, how it can transform common days into thanksgiving, turn routine jobs into joy, like that, and change ordinary opportunities into blessings. So salamat, Joanne. Thank you for sharing that. For those of you that do not speak Filipino, you will get a transcription of this in the on-demand. So thank you for sharing that, Joanne. Let's move on. All right, we're gonna pick up and wind down with a couple of other thoughts. When we look at the verses here, it now winds down and says, you know what? We need to remember something. If we want to work with joy, we need to realize that it is a gift from God. Can everybody say gift? I want you to think about the most precious gift you've ever received. And then elevate that. Because when God gives us a gift, it must be awesome. So when the Bible tells us that this is a gift of God, it's so important for us to frame it that way, we begin to see how special our work is, even if it doesn't seem like it, because it is a gift of God. He gave it to us. We begin to see it with fresh lenses. And you know what? To be honest with you, there were times during the pandemic where because I started to realize how precious our work is, given all the things happening around us, I started to hear about horrible stories of dads having to say goodbye to their wife and children because of the war, and literally, that might be the last time they ever see them. All their accounts are gone. Everything they ever owned is gone. This is a real thing happening while I'm speaking to all of you right now. So there are times when I go to the ATM, and I get emotional, and I make that a worship experience, and I say, God, thank you that I even have some cash to get from my account. It is such a gift from you that I have this opportunity to have income. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. That's what this means. We need to raise it up and say, God, thank you for giving me the gift of this work. Could it be that that is God's message for you so that you might restore, revive the work and the joy that you are lacking so sorely in the workplace? We need to re realize that it is indeed a gift of God. Now, as we look at it, 
as a gift of God, we need to make sure it does not become the God itself. We do not place it and suddenly worship it. And maybe some of us, if we're honest with ourselves or some of you, that's why you've lost your joy. You have made your work, your sense of identity or your sense of self-worth. You're beginning to see that if I don't have this, I don't have anything. Some homeschool moms that I spoke to, you know, when, when the season ended and their son is now off to college, suddenly they're wondering, what am I going to do with my life? Because I put my whole life behind this child who I homeschool. Well, the good news is our identity is not wrought up or wound up in the work we do. Our identity should be in Christ and who he has made us to be. So that is this wonderful reminder. I like what Tim Keller says to that. It is not, right, all there is to life. You will have a meaningful life without work. You will not have a meaningful life without work, but you cannot say that your work is the meaning of your life. If you make any work the purpose of your life, what is is he saying? You create an idol that rivals God. So as we work with joy, we're asking how we can do this. We realize it could be that I have made my work my idol. And that's why I'm so stressed. Or that's why I feel like I'm successful right now, but I'm looking for something. And it's not the work. Like Solomon, I've done it. I've been there. I've been that. It's not enough because we've made it an idol. How do we resolve this? You know, I remember this one gentleman who was one of the top richest men, top 10 richest men in the UK. He was the first gentleman who was able to list his dot-com company, first dot-com listed in the UK stock exchange, very successful under 30 years old, and he was buying fancy cars. If I recall correctly, he had a jet and a private chopper, and he was living the life, the life, until he got another vehicle, a a brand new Lamborghini. Two weeks after that, he saw a latest model, and he's like, I want that latest model. And then he started to get a conscience attack. And the long story short, he realized there's got to be something more. So he reaches out to some Filipino friends he knew. He wants to donate some money to a charity, about 3 million pesos worth, because he wanted to ease his conscience. And as he does that, he gets the shock because the person who's running that whole foundation is saying, we won't take your money. Why don't you come here and see what we're doing first? And then maybe we'll take your money. So this guy's shocked. He's like, who doesn't take 3 million pesos, right? Equivalent. So he goes to the Philippines, flies here, and the whole experience changes him he realizes he's been living for all the wrong things. He's made his work, that money, an idol. So uh, long story short, he sells all of that. He puts his money behind a social enterprise, and he now treats his business as a gift of God, a stewardship, taking care of his employees. And that social enterprise is now one of the most successful social enterprises in the world and has been featured in places like the World Economic Forum, etc., That gentleman is a a guy I've been able to guess. I've been able to meet again recently. His name is Dylan Wilk, and they're the group behind Human Heart Nature. He's a Christian. He loves God. And I was so blessed. You know, we need to be able to reframe our work and say, is this all I'm living for? Or can I look at it differently and say, Lord, this is a gift. I want to steward it the way you want. And as he did that, he experienced the joy of the Lord. And as we do that, we will experience the joy of the Lord. Friends, third point, enjoy work as God's gift. Enjoy work as God's gift. All righty. We're winding down. Let's wind down. What is the last thing that the Bible tells us, Edric, if we are to enjoy our work or work with joy? The Bible tells us here this. The last bonus part. So we've looked at it is good. We can enjoy work. We want to be a joy giver. And as we're going down here, we see that, hey, you know what? Uh, We need to make sure that we are able to accept our lot in life. So, you know, I need to be grateful. Um, And then we looked down here and said, you know what? We also need to make sure that we treat it as God's gift. Finally, could it be, or actually as a wonderful bonus, verse 20 tells us, the people who are working with joy, who are enjoying it, says this. I want you to let these words really impact you, they're so busy enjoying life that they have no time to brood over the past. You see, if we are working with joy as a wonderful bonus, there will be very little regret. There will be very little looking back and saying, I wish things were the way they were. 
Buti pa nung hindi pandemic, ganito yung business ko, ganito yung trabaho ko. This is how my school was, this is how my, my home situation was. Maybe many of us are living with regrets right now. Many of us are carrying these burdens and that's why we're losing the joy. We're wanting things to be the way they were. You know, the Bible tells us God makes all things new. The, good new, the bad news is it will not be the way it was. But the good news is God can make it new. And this is what we want, I wanted to unpack. As we look at this, the question I have for us is, could it be that even if this is a bonus to working with joy, could it be that we are not experiencing the joy because we're still dwelling on the past? We're still stuck in it should be this way. I wish it was like this. And that is creating all sorts of discontent, anxiety, fear, worry, lack of joy. So God is trying to remind us, hey guys, I want to remind you of these things. Let me show you. The Bible tells us in the Old Testament, do not call to mind the former things or ponder the things of the past. Forget that. Don't focus on that. Behold, I will do something new. Now it will spring forth. Will you not be aware of it? I will even make a roadway in the wilderness, rivers in the desert. The, the Bible is telling us, hey guys, stop dwelling on the past. Can you look at the person beside you as we wind down to today's message? Stop dwelling on the past. Go. Stop dwelling on the past. Instead, I like how the New Testament reinforces this thought. It says, brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself as having laid hold of it yet. But what does the Bible say? What does Paul tell us? One thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Forget what's, what's behind us. Don't let that burden you unnecessarily in an unholy way where it creates all sorts of stress and anxiety. Instead, the Bible tells us to press on. Can you say those words with me? Press on. Look at the person beside you with that encouragement. Press on. Press on. What does this mean? Now, I need to be honest with you. As we've learned CCFers from Pastor Peter and many folks, there are times in our life where if we are to fully restore or experience joy back in our lives and in the workplace, we need to follow the principle of motion before emotion. We do the right things because they are the right things as God has told us in order that the joy may follow. I knew of a very successful executive who shared her story very recently and she allowed me to share this. She was dwelling in the past. She had a great job, pandemic hit, life hit, Changes happened. She had a different job. And initially, for a long stretch, she was dwelling on that past. You know what? I had these perks. I had all of this, all this, you know, even the prestige, all the things associated to that wonderful executive cushy position that she was in. So she was dwelling in the past, even as someone who loved Jesus, until God spoke to her heart and helped her realize, you know what? I need to forget what lies behind. I cannot dwell on that. And instead, I will press on and see what I can do in this space. And she applied even the other principles earlier. She realized, you know what? This work is a gift of God. And I'm able to fully use my skills and abilities to directly impact God in this space. So because I am here, and because she did that, at least as far as I talked to her, she said she now has joy. It has been restored. So friends, as a final way to restore joy back into what we do, even in our work, press on. Let's close. I want to recap as we close. I'm a recapper, so let's recap. What are we learning? What is the main message, friends, today? Work with? Let's say that with a little bit more joy. Work with? Joy. One more time. Work with? Joy. Right. Now, let's say the first point was be a joy giver. The second one, restore joy through gratitude. The third, enjoy work as God's gift. The final point is to press on. I want to help you see how real this whole message is in the life of a dear sister who I will not share her story or show her video. Instead, she will share it to us live. And I pray that this closing story speaks to your hearts. Let's welcome our dear sister, Mads. Hi, good morning and joyful Sunday, everyone. 
It is by God's grace that I am standing here in front of you, alive, alert, awake, and enthusiastic in Christ. Let me share with you my faith journey with the so-called big sis, the counterfeits, and the real and life-giving one, my big C. First C, career. During the peak of the pandemic in December of 2020, I made the bravest decision of leaving my career with a company that I had loved or should idolize I for 10 years to the point that it had become my identity, my pride, and my security. There was really no work-related reason for me to leave as it was my happiness factory. I enjoyed my work and took it upon myself to be the brand's unofficial ambassador among family and friends. Over the years, I became known for my faithfulness and loyalty to the brand I worked for instead of God whom I claimed to serve. This was contrary to my prayer that my single season be more of Christ in me and for Him to be known in my life. And so I left, eager to realign my priorities with God's direction for me. Second C, cancer. I had planned out my life after resignation but the shock of my life happened. I became weak and sickly after my resignation and had to undergo a series of examinations, including various scans and biopsies to determine what was going to my body. I was told it could be one of two things. Either I have tuberculosis or I have cancer. I was bargaining with God and even asked my friends to pray for me na sana option one na lang. Mas hindi nakakatakot, mas curable, and higit sa lahat, mas less ang gastos. Wala akong trabaho and health card at ayokong maging pabigat, Lord. However, I was rebuked by a friend of the little faith I had to dictate to an all-knowing father about my choice when I could have prayed for a favorable result specifically for healing. I was so afraid to carry that burden and lose my life, the life that I thought I was enjoying, until I took the battle on my knees. I was reminded of what Jesus Christ suffered on the cross to save me for eternity, and that life on earth is just temporary. And so it happened that I was diagnosed with stage 3 cancer. It's an aggressive type of cancer. And the treatment plan for me was to undergo eight cycles with 16 sessions of chemotherapy plus treatments. Why me, Lord? I was caught unprepared. Psalm 90.12 says, Teach me to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. Our trip to the grave begins the moment we were born. Death is inevitable, something every one of us will have to face. But God in His infinite love for us, opened the way for us to be with Him in eternity through His Son, Jesus Christ. And as certain as the physical death we shall face one day is the certainty of eternal life for those who believe in Him. Because of this, I can face anything. Cancer does not win if you die. It wins if you fail to cherish Christ. From my initial reaction, why me, Lord? My response changed to why waste my cancer. I was reminded of how jealous I was of Christians with life-changing stories, you 180 degrees change in life testimonies to share. It felt like mine was boring since growing up in a Christian church and community, parang wala akong ma-share na big event or shift sa journey ko until cancer, until cancer happened. The chemo cycles did not come easy. On top of my weekly swab test, I started experiencing extreme nausea and vomiting, lost my appetite due to mouth sores, and food started to taste weird and metallic. Abrupt physical changes also manifested as my nails turned black, skin turned dry and darker, and most of all, my precious hair, my crown and glory began to fall off. Aside from the physical pain and crisis, there were times that it became emotionally, mentally, and financially challenging too. Although I was faced with the stresses of cancer treatment and I am unemployment, I felt God's perfect peace and inexpressible joy. God, in His goodness and mercy, 
has been so gracious to me more than ever. He provided everything that I needed, including the best support system that I could ever ask for. I am extremely blessed and grateful for my family and friends, my brothers and sisters from our D group, CCF, and Big Eastwood community, who all played the role in keeping me sane and grounded in the Lord in my journey. As much as I wanted to be discreet about my case, I used my social media platform to gladly boast of my weakness and highlight the power and greatness of Christ in me. Instead of focusing on my disability, God taught me to focus and depend on his ability. I gave him my weakness and he gave me his strength. It is during those moments that I felt God was most glorified in me as people from the community, including those that I have not been in communication with for years, and even the people I met in the chemo room, my co-cancer classmates began seeing and asking me about how positive and joyful I was. I took pride in sharing with them the hope and joy that I found only in Jesus, my rock and my salvation. One of them has even joined the D group. My thorn in the flesh made an avenue for me to pray for others as well. As my prayer warriors asked how they can intercede for me, and as they prayed for me, I endeavored to do the same, praying and interceding for others too as they message or talk to me. Battling cancer is never easy. It is tiring, but I am happy. I thank God for sustaining me throughout my journey. Just this past February, signs and symptoms of cancer began to disappear from my body. And as a bonus, I was declared, thank you, praise God. And as a bonus, I was declared in remission and fit to work by my doctor. Also, praise God. Also, earlier this month, exactly on the same day I was admitted for chemotherapy last year, the Lord blessed me with the opportunity to work again in my dream company. And this time, as a bonus, I fully disclosed to them my disability, and yet they fully accepted me. Truly, disappointments are his appointments. Third C, third C, Christ. Though I am not yet cancer-free, of this I claim with certainty. Our real big C, Christ, the giver of life everlasting, is greater than all the so-called big Cs out there. Cancer, COVID-19, challenging careers, even our own personal crisis, name it, they are nothing compared to who our Christ is. Jesus is almighty. He forgives our past, controls our present, and secures our future with Him. In the hospital, I also make sure to display this undeniable joy so that I could encourage people around me. I make sure my challenge will point people to the real source of life and joy, Jesus Christ. I am Madstum Loss, joyfully alive in Christ. To God be the glory. Praise God. Praise God, Maz. Can you just stay right here as we wind down and pray with everybody? Friends, I was so blessed hearing Mad's story and just talking to her about it that it reminded me of this one line. Can you please show this on the screen? Your work will not provide you with joy until you find joy in the one who gave you work. So as we close our time, we will pray for Mads and we'll pray for everybody here. I want to remind you of this thing. We opened with this verse. Weeping may last through the night, but joy comes with the morning. Do you remember that? And how I was blessed even by our dear pastor and how he used it. But let me give you the last parts of the verse. And this is how I want to close with all of you. From your hearts, if you have never experienced the one source of joy who is Jesus, now is your chance to do that. Accept him as the Lord and the Savior of your life. Ask for forgiveness for the sins you have committed that have robbed you from the joy that He gives. And as you do that, you will be assured of experiencing His joy here and even through eternity. And that will translate into the work, to the family, and all these things. 
like we're seeing in the life of our dear Mads. So we're going to make a prayer with everybody. I'm going to show you the verses. We'll pray with Mads. We'll pray for all of our friends and guests, relatives who might be watching online or who are here face-to-face who have never experienced the joy of Jesus because they've never received him into their life. And then we will pray with everybody the verses that connect to this as we wind down. Is that all right? Let's pray. Father God, thank you for this morning or even night or afternoon, wherever you're finding your people watching this online, on demand. We thank you that you are a sovereign God, that you love us, you are in control. And we thank you that you are the source of joy and that this joy will allow us to persevere, to overcome whatever challenges and trials we might be facing now or even into the future, whether it is in the workplace or anywhere else. And as we come to you now in prayer, we thank you that there is joy in the morning. You promised this to us. And as we pray this right now, there are friends and guests and relatives who might be with us who are hearing all of these things and are going through some things or are feeling lost. And they realize they need the joy from you. If that is you, you can make a prayer like this in your own words and heart and mind right now. Father God. I want to come before you and I want to receive the joy from Jesus. Will you forgive me for all of my sins? I ask for your forgiveness right now. And as I humble myself and ask for your forgiveness, I open my hands and I receive what your son Jesus has done for me, paying for the price of my sins, dying on the cross. And as a result of this, allowing me to experience the joy that he gives me and the joy that will help me endure and persevere as well. Salamat po, Panginoong Diyos. As we wind down and pray also for our dear sister Mads, we pray that you would bless her, allow her to continue to have your joy so that as she does, she will be able to live this out and let people see it in her life so that they too might experience your joy. That is our prayer, Father God. And now we pray together the verses that are closing us off with Psalm 32, 10 to 12. Hear, O Lord, and be gracious to me. O Lord, be my helper. You have turned for me my mourning into dancing. You have loosed my sackcloth and girded me with gladness that my soul may sing praise to you and not be silent. O Lord, my God, I will give thanks to you forever and ever. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. God bless you all.